Welcome to this hypothesis webinar on research on annotation in English and composition. I have with me Ellen Reed from Coastal Carolina University, Michelle Sprouse from the University of Michigan, Noel Braithwaite, did I get that right, Noel? Braithwaite. Braithwaite from uh, SUNY Farmingdale, and uh, Julie Severs from Southwestern University, who's in the same general area as me. I'm Jeremy Dean in Austin, Texas. I'm the Director of Education at Hypothesis. Uh, those are our presenters. I'm going to offer a brief introduction and then we'll let them take it away and share their, their research on annotation in English and composition. But first a little intro about uh, Hypothesis. Actually, I want to first start off with, if I can advance my slides, um, a quote that was shared with me actually by a, a collaborator of Noel's, um, Mary Traster is at USC, who's also doing research on annotation. She wasn't able to join us today, but she introduced me to this quote from Robert Scholz that I kind of want to just open with um, as food for thought as we discuss annotation in English and composition today. So Scholz writes, we normally acknowledge, however grudgingly, that writing must be taught and continue to be taught from high school to college and perhaps beyond. I know that personally, I got a PhD English and taught comp for many years at the University of Texas. Uh, we accept it, I believe, because we can see writing. And we know that much of writing uh, we see is not good enough. But we do not see reading. We see some writing about reading, to be sure, but we do not see reading. So that's just something I want to file in the back of your heads as we uh, have our conversation today. Um, so this is brought to you by the Hypothesis Project. We are a non-profit, uh, an open source software company developing uh, collaborative annotation software for the, for the web. Um, of course, annotation has been around for centuries, probably since at least the invention of the book. It's probably not new to anybody who decided to join a webinar on research and annotation in English and composition. Um, I taught high school and college for many years and really spent the first day of class every year trying to inspire my students uh, to, to write in their books as a critical practice for success in my class and, and for literacy um, and engagement uh, more broadly. But again, like Scholl says, I never got to see that, uh, that work um, of annotation. It was in their own private uh, paper books that they were taking home uh, every day. Maybe once in a while I'd stroll the classroom in a seminar and peer and, and see that somebody was indeed writing in the book. I actually had colleagues that would show, uh, you know, ask for students that this was in high school, open their books and, sh and show that they had written in the margins. But even that, even though it was evidence that it had happened, you know, how it was being practiced, how it was being done was not really delved into. Um, so the, what Hypothesis is trying to do broadly is bring this ancient, uh, uh, te ancient technology of annotation that, uh, you know, scholars and students uh, throughout the ages have practiced and bring it online. Um, and make it part of the fabric of the internet, not just in education contexts, uh, uh, you know, for, for classroom use and not just for scholarly uh, use, but really as a basic practice of everyday citizenship on the web. That is, if there's a layer of annotation on top of the web, the sort of critical practice of, of uh, reading closely and thinking critically that we teach in, in the humanities and English and composition especially becomes part of how we might interact with, um, with the world, with the information of the web. And that has uh, profound implications. It really raises, I think, English teachers and, and writing teachers to the, to the most important uh, role in, in, the, in the curriculum, or one of the most important roles in the sense that um, it'll matter how we're uh, looking at information and, and discussing information online moving forward. Um, but Hypothesis does have great traction in education. I'm the director of education, as I said, and uh, most of our users are uh, students in classrooms, both in the K, th uh, K through 16 uh, and uh, high school and, and college uh, levels pr pr predominantly. Um, and there's sort of three takeaways that I've uh, gotten from my experience uh, working at Hypothesis and, and before Genius and, and the role of Director of Education. Uh, from feedback I've gotten from, from teachers, from my own experiences using uh, annotation in the classroom. Um, and one of them is that Hypothesis, or really collaborative annotation, social reading, makes reading visible. So it, it does sort of subvert what Scholz is saying earlier where we don't see reading, now we can actually see the reading, right? We can see highlights, we can see comments, we can see the discussions of our students in a way um, that we, we really couldn't before. Um, in some ways that could be taken as a, as a new form of surveillance of students, right? There was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed a few weeks ago about, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, reading compliance, right? We can know that students have read, um, but I think more importantly we can know how students have read. And there was a tweet just yesterday from somebody 
um, who was interested in incorporating hypothesis, and it's the second half that I just want to draw your attention to. I'm realizing I'm grading reading comprehension without really priming it in the class. So of course, we all want the students to read in our classes, right? And we expect them to read well, but I don't know that we, how often we drill down into what that actually looks like. Um, and I really appreciated the way that Matt uh, DiCarlo, Prep Matt DiCarlo on Twitter described it as I can't really grade something that I'm not teaching uh, the practice of. Uh, so, but reading, reading made visible through collaborative annotation, now we can really engage in that practice of teaching students how to read uh, carefully. Uh, hypothesis makes reading active. And this is a, you know, close reading practices going back uh, for centuries, uh, asking students to engage more deeply in what they're reading, grabbing small bits of text and explicating it, making sure they comprehend, but also going deeper with their, with their thinking and analysis. Um, and finally, I think, and more innovatively, and I know that Alan and, and, and Julia both, I believe, written about this, the idea of uh, collaborative annotation or online web digital annotation makes reading social. There are obviously arguments that reading has always been social. People have shared their marginalia, read aloud to each other for centuries. But I think um, in uh, a piece that Julie has coming out, I, I remember her talking about, uh, you know, there's something really different here um, in, in the sort of at least the, the speed at which we're able to, to read socially. Um, and so that's, that's something new. And this is actually a quote from a student. It's one of my favorite quotes from, um, from, from a student. She, she published a blog after using Hypothesis in the class. And she says, Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? And definitely one of the biggest pieces of feedback, positive piece of feedback we get from students is that they're learning from each other through social annotation. So these three things, you know, hypothesis makes reading visible, active, and, and social is something that I've noticed as a, you know, in my role as a, a director of education. But what's really exciting about this webinar, which I'm, I'm and, and is going to be the first of a series of webinars on research about annotation in the classroom, this one focused on English and, and composition predominantly, um, is to have researchers I hope substantiate some of the off, you know, anecdotal claims that I've made in my experience or that I've, I've, I've gotten from, from users of hypothesis um, with, with actual research study, with, um, you know, uh, analysis behind it and, 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 and uh, data behind it. So that's what I'm looking forward to here. Um, and I will stop talking and turn it over to my presenters. I don't think I gave any warning to this, but what order we were going to go in. So I hope everybody's just re re prepared. But we're going to start, and I'll introduce each of the panelists right before they go. We're going to start with Alan Reed, uh, who is an assistant professor at Coastal Carolina University and an evaluation analyst at Johns Hopkins University. He's been using hypothesis for several years in a variety of contexts. Um, we've been in touch uh, since early days, and I think I've always had a nice little side conversation about his thoughts about annotation in, the, uh, in, in his courses, and he's, he's written about it. Uh, most recently, he published an edited collection titled Marginalia in Modern Context, which examines the benefits of individual and shared annotation practices. So without um, further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Alan. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. And thank you for having me again um, to this webinar. It's been, um, yeah, quite, quite a few years, several years now that I've been using Hypothesis both professionally and personally. Um, and as Jeremy mentioned, I've written several pieces on it most recently last year, uh, an edited collection um, on marginalia, uh, in which many of the chapters talk specifically about hypothesis. I think it's um, really the, the front runner for open annotation and um, web annotation in general. And so uh, let me know if, if you'd like to read more about that. I can give you some more details. I can share some things with you um, after the webinar. Just feel free con to contact me. Um, I'm going to try and share my browser here with you. So I wanted to talk about um, hypothesis in three specific ways that I use it. Um, firstly, uh, professionally. So um, in my, my role as an assistant professor, um, I, you know, we sit on a lot of committees. One of the committees I'm on is on the online teaching committee and we evaluate fellow uh, professors courses, uh, specifically online courses. And so how we do this, one of the ways that we do this is we look at their course shells, whether it's in Moodle or Canvas, um, and we give them feedback on this. And the way that we do this is via hypothesis. So we actually use the hypothesis tool to um, annotate their courses, their sites, uh, to give them specific feedback on how they can improve those sites for um, themselves and for students. So that's the first way that we use hypothesis um, currently. 
The second way that we use hypothesis um, really is, is in a very unique sort of way. Um, and that's through our digital badge program at Coastal Carolina University. So to, to give you a, a quick backstory on that, um, all of the uh, first year writing students at the university take those first two course sequence writing courses, you know, 101 and 102 in the fall and spring semesters. Um, and so what we've done since 2014, uh, we designed a digital badge program where students are actually going through um, individual badges um, that teach specific competencies with regards to the course learning outcomes. And then at the end of that, if they're demonstrating proficiency uh, in that skill, such as quoting or summarizing or what have you, then they earn a digital badge and it goes into a backpack. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with how digital badges work. But the interesting thing about this is that um, since its inception, since, since I developed the program, we've baked in hypothesis um, since the very beginning and asked students to, while they read these different things that I'm going to show you on the site, um, to annotate them and to use it, uh, to use hypothesis to do so. Um, and so essentially how the badges work, they go into the program, they uh, navigate to the badge that their professor has instructed them to work on for that particular week. Uh, let's say it's quoting and it's, they're being presented with basically a scrollable page of text that, that we've written in house uh, that's trying to give them a bunch of different guidance on, in this case, quotation. So what is it? Why do we do it? Here are some examples, um, all sorts of things. But the interesting part is that we've used the um, hypothesis tool, uh, the widget, because this is a WordPress platform that we built this on. We were able to use the hypothesis widget and uh, plugin and uh, ask students as they read these different things, as they read each of the texts for each of the badges, to annotate these things. And some professors use it as, um, as Jeremy mentioned, a compliance check, you know, basically to see are the students reading it or are they just skipping to the assignment, um, which uh, assuredly I'm sure many of these students are just skipping to the assignments. Um, so some professors are, are using it in that way, but others are really using it as a um, proactive way of, of saying, you know, this is important text, don't just skip through this. And, and, and we know that we read differently in digital and in print formats. And one of the ways that we can sort of um, anchor these readers into the text on, on a screen is through asking them to annotate with hypothesis. So that's one of the things that um, we like to do there. And the third and final way that um, I use it personally in my courses is uh, I actually use it as a way to um, uh, guide students while they're reading. So if it's an online article, for example, um, this one from Nicholas Carr, uh, I'm actually um, prompting them throughout the reading with my own annotations in the text that I've done beforehand. Uh, I'm prompting them to do different things. So for example, I might get to a, a a part in the story where I'm asking them to use a cognitive strategy like I am here and saying, okay, summarize what you've read so far. Um, or in this instance, maybe a metacognitive strategy where I'm asking the students, um, what do you understand so far? Or what have you not understood so far? What kind of questions do you have? So I'm actually using it as a teaching tool in that sense that um, this is an online text that I want students to read, but I'm guiding them along the way. So I think um, hypothesis has so many uses uh, for so many different uh, scenarios, but those are the three very different ways that I use it personally. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, um, I think I'll, I'll sort of end it there. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody after the webinar if you want to contact me regarding any of this stuff. Um, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the other presenters, if that's okay with you, Jeremy. Sure thing. Uh, Alan, quick question. Is marginalia in modern contexts out yet? Yes. Uh, here you go. Here's a, here's a URL on the chat box to it. You can check it out. Uh, but those texts are always so pricey. If you are interested in reading <laughs> something about that, shoot me an email. Um, we can, uh, I, I can get you uh, set up. So. Great. Uh, and again, I gave our panelists no warning what order this was going to go in. And I'm looking at my piece of paper in which I ordered them. And I can't distinguish there being any rationale for it, but because um, 
doesn't conform to either first name alphabetical or last name alphabetical. But in any case, everybody's ready. So we're going to move on now to Michelle Sprouse, uh, who is at the University of Michigan um, and is a first year writing instructor and also a doctoral candidate in the Joint Program in English and Education at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her current research focuses on social orientation as a tool for improving reading in post-secondary contexts. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here today um, to talk with all of you about social annotation in English and composition. Um, before I came to the University of Michigan for my doctoral studies, I was a middle school literature teacher, and that's where I started um, socially annotating with my students. And I've since socially annotated with my first year composition students and English teacher education students and as a student in my own graduate coursework. So I have a lot of experience, I think, in um, different contexts with social annotation. Um, I'm also really excited to be part of what I see as a renewed interest in reading in composition studies. In just the last few years, we've had collections like Sullivan, Tinberg, and Blau, um, Blau's Deep Reading and Salvatore and Donahue's Reading Focus Issue of Pedagogy come out. And I see this conversation really extending to across other disciplines um, like the, the Chronicle um, essay that Jeremy referenced earlier today. Um, and I'm glad that scholars and instructors are really starting to pay attention to um, reading pedagogy. Um, and I think that social annotation can be a really exciting part in helping our students to read better in our disciplines. Um, today, I hope to share a little bit about um, two of my previous studies based on social annotation and how those findings and methodologies are helping to shape my dissertation research. Um, so, in the winter of 2017, I was teaching um, first year composition for the second time. And I was really interested in how my students were engaging with their readings. And we started using hypothesis as our social annotation tool. Um, I had done some reading, uh, looking back at the kind of history of three C's, that's the College Composition and Communication Journal. And I had identified four broad reading purposes. Um, the first, in composition is reading for ideas or what a lot of people talk about as reading um, comprehension and it's the ideas that students can extract from texts. Um, rhetorical reading which is a purpose that's um, really popular in um, composition studies now and it refers to reading to identify and evaluate an author's rhetorical choices. Um, critical reading um, and here I don't just mean critical thinking skills like synthesizing or evaluating ideas, but really reading to develop a critical consciousness um, of power relationships. So those of you who were at four C's this spring, we can think about anyways, um, chairs address, um, how do we language so people stop killing each other, or what do we do about white language, language supremacy. And the fourth broad reading purpose that I found in the literature was reading for affect or thinking about if we um, refer back to Louise Rosenblatt's work, um, how students might attend to their emotional and affective responses to what they're reading. Um, so in my first year composition class with these kinds of purposes for reading in my mind, I collected their annotations over the course of a semester for all of our assigned readings and I had at the end um, I think about 12, uh, 1,200 annotations from students who chose to participate in my study. Um, and I went through after the course and I coded those annotations for those ways of reading lenses, the reading for ideas, rhetorical reading, critical reading, and affective reading. Um, I was looking for the patterns and to try to um, call attention to what are the strategies that my students are using as they read and annotate in the class. Um, and I found that they aligned generally with the, the emphasis that I saw in the literature, lots of reading for ideas annotations, um, lots of rhetorical reading annotations. And as an instructor, I was most interested in those annotations that layered, um, layered more than one way of reading um, to kind of get at something a little bit more complex in the ways that they were engaging with the text. So if they um, looked at how an author was making rhetorical choices to support particular ideas, those annotations were some of the strongest annotations. Um, but as I was working through that study and focusing mostly on just their annotations, I had a lot of questions about what my students were doing um, with the texts and with hypothesis while they were reading. Um, if you've ever annotated in hypothesis, you might know that as you highlight text and someone else comes along and highlights that same um, text, the opacity of the highlight increases. 
and I could see places where so many of my students had highlighted the same sentence that you could no longer read the original text. And yet what was happening in the margins was sometimes not actually a conversation. They might be repeating the same idea. I see Julie nodding her head there. They might be repeating the same idea, but not really engaging with each other. And so I had a lot of questions about what are my students doing when they, when they log into Hypothesis and they're completing the reading, they're complying on the surface with, with what I've asked them, asked them to do, but I'm not sure what it is they're actually doing. Um, so the following year, I designed um, another study of social annotation. This one actually I did with um, some graduate students in a literacy course, all doctoral students, um, all who had um, previous experience teaching either um, middle or high school English courses or college level writing classes. Um, and I watched three graduate students read and annotate with hypothesis. Um, we did a retrospective think aloud protocol. So I had cameras set up um, and screencast software to capture what was happening on the screen. And for two of my participants, what was happening on paper text um, around the screens as well. And then I created the videos and I met with them again and had them think aloud for me and talk to me about what it is they were doing while they were annotating those texts and what, what sorts of choices they were making um, and why they were making those choices. Um, and that was a really exciting study for me um, to listen to other readers explain why they're um, annotating in certain ways and what they're choosing to write down and what they're leaving off of the paper or leaving off of the margins, things that I wouldn't otherwise um, have any access to. Um, and there's some interesting findings from that study. The first was even though all those participants were um, doctoral students who we would consider experts in literacy practices in reading and writing, they had anxiety about the reading strategies that they were using and to what extent those strategies would be effective um, for seminar um, participation or for future writing projects. Um, for two of the students, there was a lot of reading and annotation that happened away from the screen. So they would prefer to print the text and annotate by hand and, and spend a lot of time engaging with the text before they even got to um, the screen and hypothesis and started sharing annotations with others. Um, and all express um, positive responses to that opportunity to watch themselves read and to reflect on their, on their practices um, in the retrospective think aloud protocol. And so what I'm doing now in my dissertation research is I'm trying to pull from what I've learned about how people interact with social annotation tools and the kind of methodologies I can use to get at what's happening um, as students are reading. And I'm, I'm, I've started a design-based research project um, in my own first year composition classroom again. Um, I'm planning three major iterations. I've just completed the first this term, um, and I have two more in the years that are, that are coming up. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm annotating socially again with my students. I'm collecting their annotations, I'm surveying them. I'm collecting information about their writing and looking at, at patterns in their growth in writing um, and reflective cover letters and all of my class materials and field notes. And what I'm trying to do is paint a bigger picture of what's happening in the, the classroom system um, that is shaping their annotation practices. So not just looking at the annotations themselves, but looking at all the things that are happening in the classroom around it. And I've also um, managed to schedule with some of my students some think aloud protocols again. Um, for this study, I'm not doing retrospective think alouds um, so that I only have to schedule one meeting at a time with my really busy undergrad students. Um, but again, it's so fascinating for me to watch them interact with the text and think about um, what are the things in the tools that might seem easy or obvious to someone who has some technical experience that might get in the way of my undergrad students who, despite their reputation as digital natives, are not always as tech savvy as we think they are. Um, what do they understand about the purposes for um, which that we're reading in class? Um, and how are those understandings um, shaping what they're doing in the margins of the text? Um, so I'm really excited to be working on this research. Um, and um, I don't yet have um, data from this dissertation study to suggest um, what kind of growth I'm seeing with my students right now. I'm still working through that analysis. Um, but, but it is, 
it is really fascinating for me, I think, um, to be hearing my students talk about what is happening as they read those texts. Um, and just as with my work with the graduate students, there's so much that's happening in their minds that's still not captured um, in the annotations. And I think as a researcher, it's really important to me to, to keep coming back to my participants and thinking about what are the things that they are putting down and what's not being um, shared in that, in that visual way. So that's what I wanted to share about my current research. That's awesome. Thanks, Michelle. What, what still remains invisible from the, from the literacy process, huh? yeah. despite the fact that we have these new ways of, of seeing um, evidence of reading, it's not, it's not uh, totalistic. Very interesting. Uh, great. So next we're going to hear from uh, Noelle Brathwaite, um, let me advance my slides here, uh, who's at SUNY Farmingdale. Um, and uh, Noelle is part of a research, well, Noelle got her PhD at Iowa State University and her areas of uh, research and teaching expertise are rhetoric and composition, professional communication, journalism, and rhetoric of science and technology. Um, and Noelle, uh, or no, as, as, as I understand it, I'm, this is a very secretive research study uh, that Mary Traster is also part of. I mentioned Mary before. I don't know a lot about it. They uh, presented at four C's. I wasn't able to attend it. Um, but the research group, which I believe has others involved, and, and maybe Noelle can tell us more, um, includes, I think, participants from seven institutions of higher learning. Um, and they're looking at how digital, their, their study is called Digital Annotation Tools in the College Classroom and Analysis of the Impact of Hypothesis on Student Reading and Writing Competency. I know they've conducted a bunch of research, they have some data, they have some publication coming out, and Noelle can tell us that story. Okay, yes. Um, well, actually, our group right now um, is made up of myself, Mary Tracer, um, at it, um, USC, and um, Chris Carvina at um, Northern Virginia Community College. So it's, it's a trio right now um, that, that's really focused in on, on getting our, um, looking at our data and, and putting something together for a publication. But we're we're not so much secretive as we are very in very I would I would say nascent stages, especially after um, hearing our our two uh, first presenters. Um, we are are very new to the tool. We we used the tool last semester in the fall, and that's what we're um, that's where our data came from. Um, and it was interesting, Michelle, um, to hear you talk about the the different ways of reading that you were uh, focused on because we we signaled in on on um, the the same areas sort of um, looking to see did our students um, use the tool for rhetorical analysis which um, uh, our our uh, partner Christine Carvina specifically um, was very um, sort of prescriptive in um, showing the students and going over with the students um, how to use the tool in that way. Um, but we were also looking at um, sort of effective responses um, as well as comprehension um, and as well as um, really the, the synthesis and the evaluation that you weren't necessarily looking for, Michelle. Um, so those, those were the kinds of, of things that, that we were looking at um, from the data to see how our students were using the tool, um, but we very quickly uh, discovered when we, when we started looking over um, our, our students' responses and sort of um, placing, placing the responses into various categories that we really, honestly, all three of us had much, much, um, much stronger emphases on, on sort of what we were hoping to achieve in our individual classrooms. So, because we, we have different um, student bodies, and, and um, this was all for first year writers, um, but our our students were uh, we had different sort of goals, even even among the first year writing um, um, course. So for me, I actually taught a blended class, um, which so the, half of my class. Um, traditionally probably would have been in a developmental writing class 
and uh, the other class were placed automatically traditionally in a four credit class. Um, so my number one goal was actually, um, I was really most interested in their, in their effective responses. And I really wanted to see sort of their um, just very raw interaction with the text. Of course, we, um, we, had, we had plenty of discussion about rhetorical analysis, um, and, and we definitely discuss text in that way in the classroom. But in terms of how I was hoping they would use the tool, I wanted to see comments like, um, I can really, I, I, this is confusing here for me, or um, I, I, I was glad to uh, see that the, the writer uh, brought this point up, or um, um, things of that nature, because that, that has, has sort of been a struggle that I've had um, in teaching this, this kind of uh, blended course in the past, and also just a traditional, frankly, traditional first year um, course. So I really wanted to just see them getting in, getting their hands dirty, um, and I thought, you know, that, that the tool um, was going to make this very visible um, and that, that I, I would be able to, you know, see them thinking out loud. Um, and uh, like you, Michelle, I was very, very interested in, in sort of um, what they were thinking about their reading as they were reading. Um, what I found was uh, that I, I did get a lot of um, sort of repetition um, of the text. And at first I thought that this was, um, this was not this was not a good thing, um, and this was was somehow negative. But but I realized in thinking of the ecology of the classroom, um, and sort of thinking about how the students had used the tool, um, in 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 terms of of larger class discussions and some of the writing that they did, that this wasn't necessarily the worst thing. Um, the highlighting of passages, um, even if they didn't write lengthy responses. I, I, I took this as an indication of their, and, and this, this came out too in some of the, the answers uh, to the survey questions, um, that they were, they were really using the tool as a, as a way to um, sort of reflect. Um, and even if they didn't have a, a ready response, and it's interesting to hear about your experience with the doctoral students who would do offline thinking and delving and writing before they were ready to share socially. I think maybe some of that um, for first year students, especially the develop those who would traditionally be a developmental writing class, um, maybe um, that that what I was thinking was was somehow not good was actually just a very sort of beginning stage of that engagement and and i'm i'm starting to rethink how when i use the tool again i'm using the tool currently but um really i my lessons have been learned over the course of the semester going through the data and talk having conversations with my partners so in in the future i i will also want to go back in and and maybe do some read aloud protocols um and do a lot more, have a lot more discussion with the students about um, their thinking as they're reading, as they're as they're sharing, as they're writing. The social aspect of it, um, I didn't see my students really um, answering one another. Now, my partner Chris Carvina, um, she actually built that into her assignment. They had to respond to one another one another's responses. So um, that was something that she baked in. I didn't do that, and they really didn't respond. I, I didn't really get much of an indication that they were reading each other's responses. Um, during discussion, I would actually use some of their responses um, as springboards to, um, to, to make sure that the, that the, that the, the exercise, the reading exercise, and the ensuing discussions, and hopefully the rereading that they would do, uh, they would keep in mind their classmates' responses, and they would would respond 
to their classmates' responses. If that wasn't something that I asked them to do, and on their own, they didn't do it. So we we right now are just um, at like I said, I feel at a very nascent stage um, of 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 trying to get a handle on um, how our students use the tool, um, how we can um, sort of uh, structure the the use of the tool within the classroom in ways to really capitalize on all the potential. Um, of the tool, and um, yeah, that's 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 pretty much pretty much where we are. Great, and Noelle, you guys have something that you're working on for publication. Where can people expect to find that? Is that am I right about that? That you're collaborating with Mary on something to come out in pedagogy or somewhere? Pedagogy, yes, that's that's where it will um, appear. We are. Uh, drafting our, our first draft is due in early June um, so I'm not sure of the timeline from that point on uh, but that is ultimately where it will be published is in pedagogy. Great stay tuned. Um, thanks Noel. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, actually our next Thank presenter you. has something forthcoming in pedagogy as well. Uh, Julie uh, Sievers is the founding director of the Center for Teaching Learning and Scholarship at Southwestern University where she also teaches in the first year seminar program. Uh, at the time that she did the research that she's gonna be talking about today, she was teaching literature and writing courses at St. Edwards University uh, in Austin, where she was uh, the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence, Excellence there. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, her research on annotation pedagogy is forthcoming in the journal Pedagogy, um, Critical Approaches to Teaching Literature, Language Composition uh, and Culture. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julie. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I have, uh, I want to make my comments here, but I've also created a handout with some of the information I'm going to talk about. So let me go ahead. I'm going to share the link. All right. So at the top of this page, can you all see my, it's a Google Doc. There's a link here. Yep. And that's the link just to this Google Doc page. Um, so I'm going to turn this off for a second, but I'll turn it back on in a moment. Um, I began working on annotation as a result, not so much of um, an ongoing research interest at the time I was working on other things, but some actual pedagogical challenges I was having in my classroom. Um, the project that I'm going to talk about today actually began in 2016, and um, it is coming out in pedagogy, but it's not coming out till 2021, which is a ways away. And um, so I'm glad to be able to talk about it here. I'm actually going to talk about using it in a literature course. Um, but I think in many ways, the challenges and goals I had in that course were similar to what people are describing as challenges and goals in first year composition courses. Um, at St. Edwards University, where I was teaching this course, it, it was a required component of the general education sequence. So all students had to take this. They were not there because they wanted to be. And, um, and none of them were English majors. So they were all taking a course that was gonna be their one and only literature course and where they had a lot of challenges, um, both with the kinds of reading that we ask students to do with literary texts and with writing about literary texts, developing the kinds of arguments we ask students to make about literary texts. Um, and I had, um, I had a course that was um, had been working for me fairly well, but I had a couple specific challenges that I was responding to when I started this project. One was that um, this required course was a topics-based course and faculty offered many uh, variations on this. My variation was called the Literatures of American Religious Experience and I put together the course pack and shared it through the learning management system. So almost all of the course texts were shared digitally through Canvas. And although I told students that they should print them out, uh, what I'd increasingly seen was that students were not. They were just coming to class with their laptop or often actually just their phone. And my pedagogy, I've had the privilege um, of teaching in, in uh, universities with small class sizes. So we, I don't do a lot of lecture. Um, I spend a lot of time in class working on the text and I expect that we would have papers and pencils and we would be marking things up and discussing and analyzing. And I just had found it increasingly difficult to do that. Um, so for years I've been thinking about how to, uh, 
I had made the decision that I didn't want to be policing my students on the printing issue. I obviously that would have been one option. And I know a lot of faculty who, who go that route. They just force students to buy or print text. But I really didn't want to get into that kind of relationship with my students. I didn't want to be the, the printing police. And so I decided to let them use their digital tools and to find ways to help them annotate. So, um, so I'd been looking for a while before I found Hypothesis and just the ease of use was what I had hoped would really work, that you could install the widget, it would just install a layer of annotation over a text and there really wouldn't be much technical challenge. It's interesting to me, Michelle, that you've been thinking about where there might still be some technical difficulties. Um, we did have one technical challenge, but it wasn't major. Um, so once I discovered Hypothesis, I thought, okay, that's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try using this to really um, solve this problem so that we can do more annotation. So that was the first challenge I was trying to solve. I really, um, I really wanted annotation to be the sort of building block for everything we did in the class. The second challenge was that my students were really struggling to write um, literary analysis. It's, it's not like... It's not a kind of writing that comes naturally to, frankly, anyone, but it certainly didn't come naturally to my introductory non-majors who were in a class just because they'd been told by the university that they had to take one. And, um, and in particular, I wanted them to be able to develop their own arguments about texts drawn from their own reading. I didn't want to just assign them topics. Here are five different topics to write your paper about, pick one. Um, but my students, in spite of a lot of scaffolding on my part about uh, developing um, topic ideas and then finding passages that they would build an interpretation around, they really struggled with that. And so I sort of decided this was my last stand. If I could help use annotation to help students develop organically their own arguments about a text, then I could keep having students um, uh, use their own ideas. Otherwise, I was gonna need to start assigning essay topics. So that was my second big goal. Could I develop a process by which students started writing about texts and annotations? And then they did some additional reflective writing about texts in low stakes writing assignments. And then they used the annotations and the low stakes writing to develop an essay. And in particular, I wanted to see if that essay then became something that was really richly grounded in evidence from the text. So they, they were actually going back and pulling those annotations into their final project. Um, I got an assist on the design of um, the assignments by actually one of the webinars that Jeremy ran through Hypothesis. There was a, a faculty member there who had a research project that really had students build their uh, literary essays around annotation and I, I drew on her ideas. So um, I'm gonna switch over to my screen share and sort of show you what that ended up looking like. Um, and let's see, I need to get, there we go. So um, here are the questions that I posed uh, about the class that I really wanted to think about as I um, as I worked on this project. So this was a research project based with the first iteration of this new newly formulated class. One was a reading question. Could this approach slow down their reading and build close reading skills? Um, I had a variety of reading skills I was trying to teach them including reading with attention to detail. Um, I wanted them to be looking up information as they read. We had more than half of the class had readings that were pre-1900. I'm an early American uh, scholar by training and I use a lot of early American sources. Um, could it help them begin asking reflective questions? Could it help them begin recording some of their reactions and ideas while reading? The second big goal I was interested in was this writing question. Could could annotation, social annotation, help novice students learn to move from reading the text to developing beginning interpretations and then to formulating a full argument? And so I was really thinking about very carefully scaffolding the movement between those processes. And then the third question was that, that question of the social dimension of this kind of space. Um, I wanted, in my experience, particularly teaching uh, introductory level courses, students don't get that much why we do discussion. They're not clear on why they're supposed to be learning from one another. They really want to listen to what the teacher has to say. And we spend a lot of time talking about uh, the importance of um, 
learning from one another and building on one another's ideas. And also when they're writing, for them to see scholarship and, and um, research as part of a, an ongoing conversation amongst um, uh, scholars and students. So I wanted them to see themselves learning from one another. I wanted to see themselves answering questions for one another. I wanted to see themselves sort of building on others' ideas. And so that was a third question. And then I just had some of these other questions that I think many of us have had about tools like Hypothesis. Could asking students to annotate text before class increase their preparation for class? Um, would it make them feel like they were part of a more participatory and collaborative classroom? Um, and a, a final question was, you know, my students often came into literature courses thinking that you read a text and you suddenly understand what it means that you can sort of um, extract the deep meaning of a text uh, quickly. And I wanted them to see how much everyone in the class was struggling to work through the meaning of the text. Some of our texts were quite challenging. Um, so that the effort and difficulty of reading was normalized. It was not something that students could feel that was, you know, they were the only ones struggling with. I've been uh, working at institutions that have a significant percentages of first generation students and I really just wanted to validate that uncertainty and puzzlement and confusion are common. I had, uh, I had a series of um, assignments, um, weekly text annotations. They did annotations for every text they read and if we had a text that was in print, I actually had them do annotations in um, essentially Google Docs. We were using Box, but um, and this is an example of the instructions that I provided. They could be reference checks, they could be questions about the text, they could be their ideas or reflections, they could make a comment between a text that they were reading and something else we'd read. I did have a, an assignment that was designed to help with that social piece. Each of them was assigned in pairs to a discussion moderator role that really um, asked them to synthesize the annotations. So after all the students had annotated a text, the discussion moderators would go through and write a blog post that was shared with the class that synthesized some of the common themes and ideas that the students had made in the annotations. And I asked them to, Hypothesis lets you um, link to, a, to an annotation, not just to the text. So they were supposed to cite their colleagues in the class when they mentioned an idea that emerged in the annotations, they could, they could document that. The blog posts were, there were seven of them across the course, and this is where they did a low stakes informal writing, but a little bit more extensive than the than the annotations and the margins. And then project one and two, I've hyperlinked those if you wanna look at how I structured those. They wrote an interpretive essay about a text or a section of text. And then the final piece was that they would then post public facing annotations on that digital text that drew on the arguments they'd made in their essay so that they became in a way a scholarly editor of the text for anyone who might encounter it in a public space. Um, so that was the structure. Obviously, I had a lot going on and a lot of different things. Um, I went through IRB and uh, got student consent. I developed surveys for the beginning, middle, and end of course, and then I did a close analysis of their annotations, their blog posts, and their projects. Um, after I finished uh, teaching the class, I changed institutions. And in that process, I lost access to some of my data. I lost access to Canvas. So course text that I posted in Canvas, um, I couldn't see the uh, annotations on those anymore. So I ended up choosing uh, a couple texts to do close analysis of their annotations for just based on text that I had all the data for. So I ended up analyzing their annotations on um, Benjamin Franklin's uh, Way to Wealth and their annotations on uh, Emerson's Divinity School address. Um, a couple of takeaways. Well, I want to show you just a few things here. Um, I asked them before class about their comfort level with some of the kinds of reading and 
writing we would be doing in class. And this is a fairly typical example. My students did not feel very confident on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable would they be at reading complex texts? Um, I include the second example just because it made me chuckle. Um, this student obviously felt quite confident and gave himself tens in every area. But in, in reality, all of my students were struggling with these kinds of skills. Um, the mid-course feedback showed that students, although they didn't always love the, the fact that they had to annotate every single text we read, and I decided to go all in on the annotation, so every text we read they were annotating, um, they acknowledged that it was really valuable, and they acknowledged that it helped them stay on top of it. They liked seeing their classmates' reactions. They liked seeing how others view the text compared to me, so some of this, um, some of the questions I had about whether they were getting something out of the the fact that they could see one another's annotations were uh, reinforced. Um, and then, and you can read some of this further if you go to the, the handout. And then at the end of the course, I asked similar questions again. And I'm just including, I had a bunch of questions on the surveys, but I'm just showing you two here. Um, students overwhelmingly acknowledge that writing annotations help their learning about the text. Um, 41% said most of the time here, 53% some of the time. Just a small sliver said that they felt that that was really helpful. Their answers were quite different when I asked them about reading others' annotations. Um, and, you know, I, I think that this reflects both um, their kind of um, mixed understanding of why you would even want to listen to your classmates when they're other introductory level students. I mean, I, this is something that we know students at intro, and introductory courses want to listen to the professor more than their, their colleagues in class. I also ju just would acknowledge, though, that sometimes their classmates' annotations were not that insightful. They were all struggling with the text. Emerson, in particular, if you've ever tried to teach Emerson, uh, students really struggle um, with some of these texts. And so some of the time, you know, I thought that their annotations were, um, you know, evidence that they weren't, they weren't sure about what to make of the text. Um, so this was helpful just to see what they thought they were getting out of the annotations. Um, I then did a lot of analysis of the annotations themselves. And this is just a screenshot of um, the first page of uh, Thoreau's Civil Disobedience. Um, and I did some of what, um, others have done. I was looking at what kinds of things they were doing in the annotation and I saw a really wide range. Some students were doing paraphrasing, just trying to do some first level processing of the text. I think he's trying to say this. I think he means that. Some of them were doing some more rhetorical reading. They were talking about the strategy or why he might be saying that or how that might advance an argument. Some of them were making connections to other texts. Um, some were asking questions. Some of them just voiced, I don't understand what he's saying here. Is he saying this or that? It certainly was helpful to me before I walked into a class to work on the text, to know where students were, and uh, also to know which students were at different places. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about the students' annotations was that um, it, it was really clear to students that other students were having, um, having a difficult time. And I think that that did lower barriers to, to when we got to class discussion that they, they knew other students didn't totally get it and it was a safer space. Um, but like others, the students were not naturally responding to one another. The dialogue in the margins wasn't happening. Students were piling on and each offering their own uh, comments on a particular passage, but they rarely were um, debating or, or uh, arguing back and forth. Um, let's see, I'm going to go a little bit farther. I've got one more here. Um, the, uh, there were things about the way I structured this project that I would do differently. So I'm preparing to do um, another study. I just got IRB approval in my first year seminar class here at Southwestern. And the first year seminar course here, like at many small colleges, is designed to do a bunch of different things. It's not specifically a writing course. It is an introductor, introduction to college level reading, writing, um, discussion, and other skills. And so I am planning to uh, 
frame their annotation assignments differently uh, in this upcoming study and to also really push a little harder on the social dimension. I think I'm going to have students take different roles. I think we'll do different layers of annotation, some pre-annotation and then some subsequent annotation. Um, I'm also probably going to have students uh, take the role of um, being sort of uh, a pre-annotator, pre so posing some expert questions before other students get uh, started with texts. And, um, and I'm also interested in studying that transfer to the writing. So the article that I wrote for pedagogy, I don't discuss that very much, but that was something that worked. I found that students' um, essays were, were starting from their annotations and growing from there and that the final essays incorporated a lot of the observations they'd made in their annotation. So I really felt like that piece of it was a success. And in this other course I'll be uh, studying, I'm gonna be um, trying to document that a little bit more so I can write about that. But the, the role that annotations can play in helping students develop evidence-based arguments and, and to develop their own ideas about their arguments, I think is, promising and I want to look at that a little further. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, Julie. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, on the on the panel roundtable here uh, for sharing their annotation stories and give a little bit of time for us to have a discussion amongst ourselves um, and also see if there are any questions from the uh, folks that are tuned in here um, for the panelists or stories that they want to share. So I'm going to open it up for a conversation. Hey, uh, Jeremy, this is Nate. Um, I've been sort of collecting questions as we've gone along that have come up in the chat. Um, I do notice, however, that we've already gone a full hour. It's been so yeah. interesting so far. And I don't know if some, if any of the panelists do need to leave. We should probably let them do that. Um, but we do have quite a few questions queued up for discussion. We won't go more than 10 minutes here if people can stick around. One of the first questions from um, way early on uh, was something that Dan asked around um, around differences about how one might work with beginning annotators, like early undergrads uh, or even K twelve, I suppose, versus grad students. Um, and I you know, maybe that kind of came around when Michelle was speaking. Although maybe everyone has some thoughts about that. I'll start, and then someone else can jump in. Um, my understanding is that the the movements that undergrads need to make from one text to another are a little bit smaller. So um, Noelle, I know one of your collaborator, collaborators was really interested in how students were synthesizing across texts, right? Um, but when we're asking early undergrads to do that, we're talking about typically a smaller number of texts that we're asking them to bring together. Um, and the movements that they're making are, are again, a little bit smaller. So it might be to the, in the next class discussion that they're bringing those annotations across text together, or um, you know, Julie was talking about the papers her students are writing for literary analysis. The scale of that work is a lot smaller. Um, when I was working with grad students, they're thinking about trying to, I've shared before um, a metaphor of this moving train. They're trying to jump onto this train of discourse that is barreling along and they're just trying to like catch up to it. Um, and things are moving quickly um, in that conversation. And there's so much more that they're trying to kind of bring together. And so that for me is one of the major differences between the work that undergrads need to do and the work that grad students need to do. Um, but, but at both levels, there's still the, the work of, do I understand what this person is saying here and how am I making sense of what they're arguing? That's work that, that's happening across um, both levels. Um, what do I notice about the strategies the, the author is using to make this argument or to develop this, this text? Um, those things I, I see in common across both levels. Anybody else want to respond to this? I was also struck by the diversity of ways of reading. You know, we're using this one term reading to talk about a lot of different things in different mm -hmm. educational contexts. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I had expectations, my expectations um, were were uh, not at all aligned with, with what I saw my students doing. And quite a few of my students are, would be categorized as developmental writers. Um, 
and I thought that they they would be responding more to one another, and um, I thought um, as we moved further along in the semester and did more work with rhetorical analysis that I would see more of that in their hypothesis responses. But what I saw a lot of, um, and, and, and Julie spoke to this, was a lot of really grappling um, to, to make sure that they understood what the writers um, were, were putting forth. So I did see a lot of uh, paraphrasing um, and sometimes plagiarism that, that turned into some paraphrasing. And I, and I realized how valuable that actually was um, for them. Um, and I, I, I really saw that, that this was something that was, that was helping them to learn the distinction between paraphrasing and plagiarizing. And, and um, I don't think they were paying attention whatsoever to one another's work, but um, if they did, they certainly would see that everyone was struggling and sort of doing make, with that same move. Um, and it was, it was very enlightening for, for me to see them doing that at that stage. Um, and yeah, so I think, I think that there's great value in that. I just want to add to that, Noel. I was talking to a professor at Cal State Channel Islands uh, a couple weeks ago, and her assignment specifically was, you know, trying to get at that distinction that you're saying. She'd seen students sort of plagiarizing in their summarizing or talking about the primary literature they were studying. So her hypothesis assignment was specifically grab a paragraph and paraphrase it. Show me your paraphrasing skills. Just that, because that is a, an important thing to learn. It's a stage that some Absolutely. students are at, and it's part of the reading process. And there's other parts too, maybe for later in the semester for further courses. But that's a that's a key skill. And yeah, yeah. One one other comment on that. Um, back to that question. I think. Um, I, I, I now use hypothesis in all my classes and the class I uh, taught last, my students, at, one of my students actually said, I would read my fellow students comments more if there was more guidance about what kinds of comments they should be making. And I, I've usually sort of opened it up, like you could do this or you could do that or, um, but I think her sense was that some students comments were um, not that helpful because they were just you know, they were just reacting. And I had wanted to create space for students to have an emotional reaction to the text if they wanted to, if that was what was, particularly this, uh, this current class I'm talking about is not a literature class. It's about a social issue, sort of social issues, and students do have um, personal stakes in those issues. But now I'm thinking that maybe giving them more practice with different uh, types of annotations. So sometimes they're looking things up and sometimes they're arguing back and sometimes they're commenting on their own feelings or ideas and you know maybe even using uh, Michelle's sort of frameworks for different modes of engaging with the text but that my my st my students thought was that they would engage more with others annotations if others were getting a little bit more uh, support around what kinds of annotations might be helpful and so I've been thinking about that a little bit and um, again I'm dealing with first year students here so there are students who, this is their first actual college course, and um, they're hungry for guidance. I would imagine the doctoral student situation is obviously totally different. Nate, anything else you want to surface from the chat? Well, yeah, um, there's a couple of other questions, actually. And again, I don't want to keep people past their comfort zone, but um, uh, Anya uh, brought up uh, the question around um, good annotation exercises to get students started. And we did have a quite a bit of discussion in the chat around annotating syllabi. And uh, Dan brought up the idea of having students annotate, annotate rubrics. So there's some ideas already circulating in chat that maybe if any of the other panelists have some ideas around um, how to get students sort of warmed up and started with annotation. I'll make one really quick comment. Um, the the very first text my the, the very first time I used hypothesis, the very first day of class, I assigned them to set up hypothesis and then start annotating Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and um, they just did it. I mean, that's not to say that there isn't value to giving them warm ups, but that was part of what was surprising to me about using hypothesis is that 
within 24 hours, I had students annotating a text uh, with very little, um, there seemed to be very little barrier to them to jumping in. And, and I found that sort of surprising because some of the research I'd read talked about the technology itself being an, an issue. So I'd be curious to others' thoughts about that, but um, I kind of just threw them in and, um, and they got started and it worked fairly well. I do like the idea of having them annotate like rubrics and even the course website that could be really interesting. I, I did not do this, but as I, as I heard the question and I started thinking a little bit more about it, um, I have in the past had students as a group um, analyze images, paintings, um, uh, non sort of nonverbal, do some nonverbal analysis. And, and I'm thinking about it, you, you might be able to take a poem. Um, and and have students sort of try to analyze it and and respond to it. That might be a, an icebreaker where everyone's definitely starting off on an even playing field, where they're probably used to being invited to interpret um, pieces of of work like like poetry in a way that they may not feel comfortable interpreting or analyzing um, a more academic text. So that's just something that I just thought of off the top of my head. That might be a way to kind of get them get them loosened up and to feel like that that, that it's it's safe to hazard some guesses and some some interpretation. I like that a lot, Noel. So Ryan Rich at uh, I think he's at Buffalo now um, has done a workshop where he does really analog um, uh, annotation practices. Where he'll print out a blown up image of uh, something from the news or a paragraph and then have students gather around and kind of put post-it notes on it. So just reminding folks that this comes from a, you know, traditional, for, for some of us at least, you know, traditional uh, practices that we're familiar with. When I started using Genius, I would, I would put the roster up and have students annotate and just uh, highlight their name and like uh, have the three questions, like put your favorite, you know, put a picture of yourself and your favorite, uh, I don't know, something, a uh, little goofy getting to know you kind of thing, um, just to get to know the tool, but also to introduce each other, um, introduce themselves to each other. You know, maybe we have time for one more question. Um, although obviously we could stick, I'm sure Jeremy and I can stick around for anybody who wants to keep talking. But um, Jennifer what brought up the interesting idea of if you guys have seen any differences or have any thoughts about how annotation might be different uh, in a face-to-face -face course versus an online or hybrid course? I have only used it in, in fully face-to-face -face courses. But Noelle, you said you used it in a blended course? Well, um, so my course was blended in the sense that um, there's actually another term for it, and it isn't blended because blended is hybrid. But um, so half of my class um, w were made up of, of uh, students who who had been placed in remedial English, non credit bearing English, and half of the students were students who had been um, placed in four credit. So it was half developmental and half um, sort of traditional one on one. Right. So th that's what it, there's, I can't remember the word for it. But no, so I, I've only taught face to face. And I think I would be. Um, I think it, I think it, I don't know about using it for first year students um, in a in a hybrid or an online setting. I mean, I think it would be a great tool, but I don't know that that you would you would always um, get the kinds of responses maybe that that would allow them to um, sort of really express themselves. I think students who'd, who'd been student, college students for longer, maybe upper level courses, I think that might be a better way to, to, to use it in a hybrid setting. But for the first year, I think that might be difficult. One thing I think you'd, you'd notice more in a, in a <clears throat> fully online se section is that it's not it's not just the annotation and the close reading and all the all the elements of the reading process, but the 
the social is going to become more important, right? Because that it, that could be the form in yeah. which students are predominantly interacting. I think it's a deeply, I mean, for me, it's the closest I've ever been to a seminar class is, you know, being on the same page as folks uh, and annotating. And you might see a lot more of that social behavior coming out. Uh, cer certainly would be a good time to encourage it. Um, any last comments from our panelists on that issue? Most folks were teaching face-to-face. -face, so I don't know if we have a lot of the online experience in this context. Um, I want to thank folks for sticking around. Um, as I said, this is the first of a series of webinars on, uh, on research and annotation and Hypothesis hosts webinars on annotation education uh, throughout the year. Uh, Nate and I also really aspire to, to cultivate a community of practitioners around annotation and education. I believe, I'm all confused by my windows here, but I believe I'm sharing the contact information of our panelists here if you want to follow up about um, their research or connecting and possibly collaborating. Noel and others are, are working in a, in a research group, um, getting together for panel presentations, hypothesis hosts events. We have an annual conference coming up um, just a couple of weeks in DC if you're in the area. Should definitely try to get Chris to come down, Noel. I'd like her to come over from, uh, from Virginia, that'd be great. Um, and we host at conferences piggybacking on various ed tech and, and scholarly conferences throughout the year to try to really cultivate a community of practitioners around annotation and hopefully some of you that are uh, presenting, but also some of you that are uh, participating as attendees here might join us face to face sometime or just continue to stay tuned to the, to the work that the community is doing. So thanks everybody for participating and uh, especially the panelists for sharing their work.